Hi, everybody. My name is John DiPietro. And I'm Bob Zagami with the Camper Report Show. And on this edition of the Camper Report Show, I'm going to be talking with Patrick Botticelli, who is the editor of a YouTube channel with over 200,000 subscribers. It's called New Jersey Outdoor Adventures. He has some very interesting concerns about people who may want to build their own RV, their own van from scratch. Well, reading some of the stuff that we see on social media, I have concerns about it too. So I look forward to that one. And uh, I've got an interview with Bill Martin, uh, co-owner and VP of customer service at Alliance RV. Been on the scene now for three or four years to get a very interesting business model on how they constantly communicate with their customers and prospects. Right. And what we want you to do, folks, is to subscribe so we can contact you directly. So just hit that subscribe button down in the bottom right hand corner and you'll get all of the news before it hits the general public. And speaking of the news, we want to thank our partners at RV Business and Woodall's Campground Magazine for being with us every week right here on Where Bob? The Camper Report Show. Stay with us, everybody. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Kemp Report Show. My name is John DiPietro and right, I always do this wrong, right? Over there. Well, it depends on where Christopher puts us. <laughs> right <laughs> over there is probably John. We actually have no, no say in that at all. Yeah. So here we have the news segment. And Bob, you know what? It sounds like a broken record, but we get statistics every month from the industry they get more and more impressive every month. Why do we tell consumers this? Because we want consumers of new RVs. And there's so many, what, what a, a million new consumers in the past two years of new RVs. We want them to feel good about their investment that they make. So give us some of the latest numbers that are out on the street. Yeah, these, these are the retail stats that uh, tr- actual registrations. These are people that have bought, hit the road, put their license plates on, and going down the road, 567,079 registrations in 2021. And that broke the record, is up, is up 43,000, almost 44,000 units, 8.4% increase from the 5,023,098 in 2020. So to your point, over 1 million new RVs on the road. Yep. This, you know, last year in the last two years, which is kind of crazy. But the reason we tell people is when, when they go to a dealer and, you know, the dealer says, well, that's not going to be in for six months. Or if you order it today, it's not going to be here for a year. They understand the impact that COVID has had on our industry. We would have sold a lot of RVs without them, but we would not have sold a million RVs if we didn't have the COVID pandemic. Yep. And speaking of selling a lot of RVs, Automotive News, the magazine called Automotive News, the trade publication, it's kind of like the Bible in the automotive industry, is taking note of the RV industry more than ever before. In fact, I don't even know if they, if it was even a blip on their radar or was never even talked about at editorial board meetings. But now there are stories, every issue that comes out of Automotive News. Give us a scoop on the latest one. Well, I I actually subscribe to Automotive News and have for a couple of years because I look at the automobile industry in terms of what new technologies are we going to have in the RV industry? They're going to work their way downstream. So it's something that I can advise our dealers on or comment on when people want to, you know, understand the differences between automobiles and RVs. But they had a very good story and, and it was basically a recap of some of the information that we showed from uh, the Tampa show in Florida, quoting the uh, Winnebago and the Thor people from a little bit different angle. They had a quote from Chad Reese at Winnebago that thought that you might see these things in two years. And I think both of them to their point were very careful in making people understand that it's still a concept vehicle. And what comes to the market in two or three years may not be any, I won't say it won't be anything like what's there, but the components and the technology are changing every day, it seems, in that field. So the battery that they're using this year is probably not going to be the battery they use next year, and it'll probably change again before the production unit comes out. The same thing for the uh, 
the charging stations, the charging system. So a lot of the components that we saw on the concept vehicles will find their way into production vehicles, but it will not be a one-to-one -one, uh, process on it in yep. terms of that. Yep. So when the automotive industry looks at you, you've got to be making waves. Now, one other thing that I've noticed, and it's along the same lines of, of batteries, et cetera, I just noticed that um, now being promoted to the campgrounds, we've always talked about, well, wait a minute, if we get these electric RVs in the campgrounds, how are they going to be recharged? And secondly, if you've got an electric pickup truck, how is that going to be recharged? And the answer to that is coming clearer and clearer every day because I just saw an ad for a company that makes those, um, the posts, what do you call them? The charging posts at charging post. the pedestals. On the <laughs> side. RV park. On the side, um, yeah. That both provide electricity for the RV when it's sitting there and you'll also be able to charge your electric vehicle to tow that RV. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it, it's, they're both on the same pedestal. Now, this is going to be a major investment required from the campgrounds to put these in, especially if they put them in every site. I suspect what you'll see is that they will gradually phase them in and maybe they'll have five available and they'll charge a premium for those sites over what the regular sites could be. Not only now will it be water, sewer, and electricity, but it'll be water, sewer, electricity for your RV and electricity for your automobile. Yep. So if you need that type of accessory, you're going to pay more. You're either going to pay, you're going to pay for it one way or the other. You'll pay for it in a, a site fee that's going to be more expensive than the traditional full hookup, or they're going to meter the electricity and you're going to have a separate charge when you check out on the amount of electricity that you used but the products are here now and they're just being introduced and shown to the campground industry itself to those owners. But you can see that they will start to phase those in. And it's a company called Jamestown that is well-respected in the campground community. It's not somebody new coming on the scene that may not know what they're talking about. This, this company knows what they're talking it's about. Right. They're, they're, they're ready. When the campgrounds and the resorts are ready, they're ready. There we go. So everybody, before we give you those two great features that we have every week. Hit that subscribe button down in the bottom right-hand corner, and you will be getting an advanced copy of the Camp Report Show every week. Stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back with more on the Camp Report Show. Mike here from RV Blogger. Don't waste hundreds of dollars on an external GPS for your RV. All you need to do is download the RV Life app right onto your phone. This app is so cool. It has RV GPS built right into it. So you can load all the specific measurements and weights for your RV. It'll give you directions safe for your RV to follow. And by the way, if you have RV Trip Wizard, directions for your trips upload into this GPS automatically. All right, welcome back everybody to the Camper Report Show and got a good friend on today, uh, Bill Martin, VP of Customer Experience at Alliance RV. And then one of the new guys on the block uh, started the company about fall of 2019, I think, Bill. And uh, you, you've had tremendous growth uh, of the company. Give us a little bit about your own background and uh, the alliance, the formation of Alliance. Uh, just uh, I came, I've been in the industry for 22, 23 years now, uh, have been on the manufacturer side and on the supplier side of the business. And um, just as I've grown up in the industry, just it was a great opportunity to join uh, the co-founders, Ryan, Ryan and Coley Brady, to uh, help uh, bring Alliance RV to life. And um, it, it's been a fun ride for the last uh, few years here, getting things going. Um, you know, again, as you said, I, I had up the, the customer experience side of things for the company. It's just been, it's been a real pleasure to start a company and be able to uh, engage and interact with customers like I don't like we haven't seen historically. Well, you know, one of the one of the interesting things about the RV industry, and you know, I've been reporting on it now for 25 years myself, and you've got a long history in it, is just when you think that the industry has done everything that they can do or make as many products as they can make, somebody steps out of the pack and says, I think I can do it differently. And Coley and Ryan came to this with a lot of experience, like yourself, and said, We can do this differently. And one of the things that impressed me 
before you ever built your first product was that you went to the consumers themselves. You crowdsourced. Tell us the story about crowdsourcing from the customers and the, the input and how valuable that was to making such a successful company in three years. Oh, absolutely. So we were five or six months before we were even considering bringing our first product to market. We were just doing our due diligence and research and we decided to start a Facebook page. We all had a number of people that we've interacted with from multiple different manufacturers. So we said, let's just see what's going out there. And we'll just kind of, we'll start this to be just very transparent. We'll ask these RVers, what do you like? What do you not like about your current product? And man, they just started spilling, spilling their guts out with, you know, I like this. Why don't manufacturers do this? And man, what a great way for us to design a product from the ground up. I can't tell you how many features in our coach. We were headed one direction and somebody would ask a question. We're like, that makes sense. And you'd see that question a second or third time. And next thing you know, we're going to engineering. We're saying, hey, why don't we do it this way? This makes more sense. It's just no one's been challenged in that way. Um, typically, product development in the RV industry is a guy or a gal is a product manager for a product and they make all the decisions somewhat in a bubble. They go to shows and, and consider that their research. But we were getting comments from thousands and thousands of our viewers. So, I mean, before we built our first product, we had 2,500, 3,000 people on our Facebook page giving us feedback. We well, were I, showing I, them. Go ahead. I, yeah, I, I was one of them. I, I jumped on there early because I wanted to see how this was going to develop. And and you had strong backgrounds because all of this stuff wasn't necessarily positive, especially if they had different views of the industry that frustrated them, but they were able to explain them and they were able to, you know, honestly talk about, well, this company does this or this does this, or you would, you would actually present multiple. I think, I thought one of the best things was you would present multiple floor plans to them and get their opinion. So you show them two floor plans and then take the best of, you know, the first one, the best of the second one, but based on the customer's experience, based on what they've done through the years. And that had to be tremendously uh, popular. It was popular, but it must have been very critical in your success because when you made the product, you made the product that the consumer wanted. Uh, it, it, that's one comment we get a lot is we didn't see this coming, but you know, we knew the people that were on Facebook and had followed us for 12 months. They knew about the product. They knew the ins and outs of it. But what we're seeing now, it shows is somebody who had never heard of us was referred to by somebody that knew of us. They'll come in. They're like, wow, somebody listened. That to me is the biggest compliment that you can get is they didn't follow us on Facebook, but they can tell when they spend 10 minutes in the product that somebody listened to what our viewers are doing. So yep. Yep. it's definitely resonating with the product. And, and the motto that you had uh, coming out the gate, as you all sat around and said, let's build this new company, but let's build it differently. Your motto is do the right thing. May not be the most profitable thing. Uh, it may cost you a little bit more money, but do the right thing. And I think you've subscribed to that and you practice that every day. And, and what kind of feedback do you get from the customers when they realize that somebody listened to them? <laughs> yeah, the, the do the right thing is definitely, it, you know, if you don't do the right thing, it's just a saying and it's corny. But when you do actually do the right thing, I think we have, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody, even if they've had issues with one of our coaches that would tell you we didn't work very, very hard to try and do the right thing. And doing the right thing is working individually with customers to make sure everyone's got their own unique set of circumstances. You can't just have a policy for everything and it's black or white. We absolutely live in that world of gray and you were dealing with big fifth wheels. Some people tow them, some people have them towed to their lot and sat there and they don't even have a tow vehicle. How are you gonna get them serviced? So we have to get real creative and it's a case by case scenario so to me, that's what doing the right thing is, is listening to each customer, what's your circumstances and how can we best work within that? That doesn't mean it's just an open checkbook and we can <laughs> send you anything you ever wanted for free, but yeah. you're going to find our team gets real creative and works very hard. We want you to be happy with your coach and go to great lengths to do so. Yep. And, and if we go back to that crowdsourcing for a minute, that that still goes on today. And you talk, you have this active communication with your customers and your prospects because people join that site who are thinking about doing with Alliance. But 
you're the key man on there. You, you respond to a multitude of the questions that come up and say, Hey, I'm Bill Martin and I'm with Alliance RV and you're one of the founders of the company. And, you know, how can I help you? Or here's, here's my cell phone number. Give me a call on that. And, and then you start the action right there, pass it on down through the company and get resolution to the customer. Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's very humbling. I'm honored to have a position. I do get the forward facing. I get credit for a lot of stuff, but you have to understand it is all about our team. If you hire great people, you get great responses. So, I mean, I get credit for taking care of somebody. All I did was a liaison to get them to the right people. But that's another thing that we're doing. I think that's been quite innovative. It's behind the scenes. Um, first, we have retail uh, service reps. And um, our last two hires actually came from 911 Dispatch. Uh, but you think of somebody to take a retail customer's call who's good at de-escalating a hot situation. You don't call us because you're super happy with something that failed on your coach. You call us because you want resolution. These new hires did not have RV experience, but they knew how to take care of a customer, how to listen, and how to find a resolution. And, and it's paid off in space. They're just doing phenomenally. But thinking outside of the box, finding those non-traditional avenues. I mean, if you go to the traditional RV channels, you're going to get traditional RV responses. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that in your growth, in, in this rapid growth that you have, talk about the, the campus that you've already built out there in Elkhart. You're on your third building now, right? Uh, we're on our third, uh, prepping for a fourth production facility. Uh, we also have a 120,000 square foot lamination facility on top of that. So we've, uh, we've built on our campus pretty quickly here. In About one a year. That's what we set out from day one. And mm -hmm. we're holding true to that. And they're all in one location. So all the people <laughs> there, all the productions there, all your inspection, everything under the one roof. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Now, in, in your retail end of it, you also subscribe to a little bit uh, of a different philosophy. You have explain your one dealer, one market philosophy and why that's important to the consumer, but why it's also important to the dealers that you're asking to sell your product when they have other products on the lot. Oh, yeah. So the traditional RV model has been you have the big guys out there and I don't want to pick on them, but they have 30 different brands. Um, one dealer here in brand and market A will carry two of those 30 brands and then they'll set up a dealer a mile down the road that carries two or three other brands from that same manufacturer. And they, they, that's kind of how they fill out their product line. Um, what we've done is if you are an Alliance dealer, you, you are able to carry all of our product lines. We don't split it up amongst different dealers in the same market. Um, so you carry all of ours. But what that does is you're invested in Alliance, not just paradigm or just valor you are an alliance dealer it's it's marketing behind that single name it gives our team better focus it gives the dealer better focus they've got one point of contact for service for sales um it just it, we put all our eggs in one basket we can uh we work closer with our dealers that way it's not about having 600 dealers it's about having 200 or 250 dealers that we're in close communication with yep Yep. And, and, and let's talk a little bit about the product line. So if some of our consumers are watching and somehow they may never have heard of Alliance RV, which is impractical, but uh, you've got a great name in three years. Talk about your product lines. You're primarily right now a fifth wheel company, but tell us the, the logic between the three brands. Oh, sure. So uh, Paradigm was our uh, initial product offering. That's a full profile larger time, you know, extended stay type of a fifth wheel. Again, that's where we did all of our research and uh, development processes, starting at that higher end, knowing that quality needs to be of utmost importance, listening to the customers is of utmost importance when we build this. Figured if we can design that to the taste of those higher end, higher cost buyers, um, we, we will take those key things as we get to more cost-effective price points or lower price points and take down those key things, make sure that you're building quality in as you get, as you go down the product lines. But so we have three product lines right now. We have the Paradigm, which is a full profile fifth wheel, the Valor, which is a full profile, full size toy hauler product line. And then we had the Avenue, which was just recently launched within the last uh, four months or so. Um, but that's a mid profile, kind of expanding the scope of what trucks can tow our fifth wheels. 
Yeah, it, and, and it's a great product line. The dealers love it, and the uh, the reps do a great job getting out there and uh, doing education. So you, you've carried the education through the dealer concept also because product knowledge is so important to uh, – and, and, and again, to your point, if, if you're carrying 10 or 15 brands, can you know everything about everything that's on every one of those brands versus being loyal to a particular manufacturer? You may have other brands on there, but like you said, with Alliance, you've got all their products. You know the people at the factory. You can respond to the customers, which you've done amazingly well. Our guest this morning has been Bill Martin, uh, VP of Customer Experience. That's a great title, Bill. It's, uh, it, it says exactly where your, where your day is focused from the time you get up to the time you go to bed, uh, focusing on the customer experience. And, and that's the starting off point for a lot of people who become part of uh, the Alliance family. And uh, they're all called allies, right? Yes. Yeah. That's the Alliance, the allies. And, and uh, you've got a rally coming up this year. You've, you've had them in the past, but you're moving to bigger and better quarters because you've got more allies that want to come to the annual rally, right? Yeah, uh, 4-H Fairgrounds in May. We have about 250 units uh, scheduled to be there. So it's going to be 520, 540 people. That's fantastic. Look, yeah. I want to thank, thank you very much for joining us today, Bill. It's always a pleasure to catch up to you and it's Kind of nice when we can do a little one-on-one -on -one and introduce the people and let them, let them see the real people behind the company. Bob, thank you so much. All right. We'll talk to you down the road. All Bye, right, sir. I'm Jesse from Outsiders Calling, and I love adventurous family travel with my wife, Jenny, and our son, Tucker. For over three years, we've RV'd across the U.S. and Mexico, and it's tough to find places that meet all our needs. Now, we plan our trips with the RV Trip Wizard, pull it up in the RV Life app, select it, and go. It helps us discover amazing new places to grow together as a family. RV Trip Wizard with the RV Life app is an awesome trip planning combination. You can get both for one low annual price. Check out rvlife.com to learn more. Hey everybody, my name is John DePietro. Welcome back to the Camper Report Show. You know, one of the areas that is experienced phenomenal growth, has been experiencing phenomenal growth, and it continues to do so, is the van life aspect of RVing. And today we're going to be talking with a national expert on RVing. And I want to bring him in right now. His name is Patrick Botticelli, and he is the proprietor of the fantastic news channel, YouTube news channel, about New Jersey RV adventures. And um, Patrick, thank you so much for joining us here on the Camp Report Show. It's great. Glad to be back. Thanks for inviting me back on your channel. You know, when we talked to you last, um, it was the middle of the summer and people were experiencing uh, delays in getting their vans um, that they ordered from dealerships and traditional sources uh, because of all the different supply chain issues, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, what has really led to a boom in DIY campers, if you will, people that were uh, that had some mechanical ability some carpentry ability, some plumbing ability, some electrical ability, and putting together their own van. Um, talk a little bit about the pros and cons of both of those, because you're in the uh, RV business, you sell vans, but you also own one. And, um, you know, that's why I wanted you to um, be our resource for this. So talk a little bit about the kind that you can buy from a dealership, and how they would compare and contrast with buying one and uh, buying an older truck and putting it together yourself. Yes, absolutely. So being in the RV business for 19 years, I've seen a tremendous growth in the class B camper van market. Back in 2002, if you combined all the major manufacturers that were building camper vans, you would see a combined shipment of a, less than a thousand units. So the big players back then were Airstream, uh, were Pleasureway, Road Track, uh, those are your big three. And then you had some smaller companies that were building class Bs. Yep. It wasn't a big market segment. Back then, everybody was buying big class A motorhomes, big travel trailers, big class Cs. So the industry is in a downsizing trend, which has 
risen popularity in class B camper vans. And with the whole van life, you know, hashtag and van life segment, people are really attracted to the idea because they see the freedom that you get by owning a camper van, not having to go to an RV park. Uh, so uh, now bring in COVID and the huge spike in people want to buy RVs and especially camper vans, you have together, now you have 20 big RV manufacturers that build camper vans uh, in, in, in a production style. And mm -hmm. uh, the shortage of chassis, shortage of materials, these manufacturers couldn't keep up with demand. So the homemade type camper van market, which has always existed, has really boomed. And then a lot of people then start businesses based on because people would build one, yep. they post pictures online and people say, hey, can you build me one too? So I've seen a lot of really great companies start up as, as part of this. Yeah, and they became more mainstream too for different populations. It wasn't just quote unquote, the Cheech and Chong hippie that had the smoke coming out of the van and um, you know was hand painted with several different colors on the side. Um, it all of a sudden became cool to have a van. It became cool and they became luxurious and they were a lot more comforting, comforting to meet people's demands, right? Because people have a certain level of expectation of what experience they want when they go out RVing or camping or going into the van. And now you have full wet baths, you have lithium batteries, solar charging system, very comfortable beds, very comfortable seats. And you know, just 10 years ago, you'd buy the most expensive Class B camper van motorhome, and it would be a bare bones commercial chassis that you're yep. driving with an awesome conversion in the back. Now, Mercedes and Ram and Ford has really stepped it up on their van chassis to give a very high end luxury feel to their chassis and feature level, as well as the safety features. So it's very attractive for a lot of people. Some of the challenges that come up when when you get into the homemade camper van market is, uh, for one, it, it's difficult to get insurance. So you, you buy the van, you build the van, and the van's worth a lot more now because you did a conversion, but yep. who's insured for that? And a lot of the uh, insurance companies are asking for an RVIA, like who is the manufacturer that built it? Who inspected it? Uh, so a lot of people are running into challenges. I, I don't have a DIY camper van, but I did a lot of mods to it and I brought the value from this all the way up to here. And I still have that problem. There's a gap there in insurance. But when somebody's doing this on their own, number one, they might not even know what RVIA is. And uh, secondly, they're not going to have an RVIA seal on it. Which Correct. Has been kind of like the good important. housekeeping seal of approval, if you will. Correct. It's just like a home inspector coming to your house to right. inspect your work. That's what the industry goes by. So the smaller camper van companies are not RVA certified. Uh, I know one of them just became a uh, storyteller RV. They're now RVI certified. So they have a dealership network uh, uh, they're building throughout the country. So, you know, some of the smaller companies are coming up and they're understanding what the customers want. Uh, another thing is uh, financing. You know, a lot of the smaller uh, van builders have figured a way through commercial financing through the van manufacturer to get financing for the build. Uh, but the RV financing is very attractive. So if you buy a camper van that's complete from a RV manufacturer, you can get an RV loan on it. And you can get loans anywhere from 10 to 20 years with rates in the 5% yep. uh, rate and, and maybe 10 to 15% down, where on a DIY build, it's definitely not going to be that long of a term and the rate might be higher and the down payment might be much higher. Which makes it, you know, three barriers of entry. The rate's too high, the term is too short, and um, you can't get it anyway. Yeah, and then yeah. another thing, too, that comes up is one day it's going to, someone's going to want to sell it, right? And right now, people are understanding the shortage of RVs, and they see these home builds, and, and they're great value. There, there's some spectacular builders here in our local area, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, some really great builders, but you know, that buyer might want to get a loan on it and they can't, they not, might not be able to get the loan on it. Uh, or there's no like NADA book value that you can look up these DIY camper vans. So uh, that- No basis of comparison. 
Yeah. So th those are things that are going to come up on the horizon mm -hmm. as uh, more and more people are doing DIY builds or small uh, shops that are building their own custom vans. The advantage to that is the lead time. So, you know, RV manufacturers right now, say for camper vans on the Sprinter chassis, due to supply chain challenges, you want to order something, you're looking at eight months to 24 months lead time to get one. Right. Yep. For a small manufacturer, they'll buy, you could buy a used van and bring it to them and they could get you in their production queue anywhere from two weeks up to six months. So you get it in and get it done. But a lot of people that are looking to do something now are going to probably take that approach or go out and buy a used camper van from an RV manufacturer. Which Okay. So you're introducing a whole new element here that I was not aware of. So we're, we were really talking about the factory production model versus the total DIY. Now, what you're telling me, if I read this correctly, Patrick, is that um, if you have the van, which the manufacturer, which the, the uh, what do you call it? The fabricator, if you want, you know, the, the people who build the back end don't have, you can bring it to them and they will build the house inside your truck. They will. It's, it's not uh, any of the RBI manufacturer that would do that, but it would be uh, a smaller shop that does custom camper vans. And, okay. you know, you source the van because a lot of them don't have a DMV uh, license. They're not a, a car dealer or yeah. an RV manufacturer dealer. Yeah. So they don't sell the van. And so you bring the van to them and they'll build the van out for you. Okay. Okay. So that's and, a whole uh, other segment there. It's the third option. And it sounds like what you're telling me is that is that's the fastest way to um, get what you want without having to um, put your own sweat equity into it. Correct. And a lot of those DIY camper van bills that were done in people's driveways became these smaller companies that are doing van conversions. Yep. And, and, and I think it's just going to continue growing. I don't think this is just a fad and then uh, once things get back to normal or are going to, you know, fade away. I think these companies are going to be there and survive. They, they found their own niche market for people that want to travel in a different way. Uh, I think as the years go on, uh, people are going to want more and more freedom to be able to not hop on an airplane to go away or not take a car trip and have to stay in a hotel. They want to have their own vehicle with all the amenities that they could possibly have at home or some of them. Yep. And be able to do amazing things. I own a 97 Airstream B190 camper van. And uh, very few of them were made. And I took one and I didn't build my own. It was there already, but I modified it. I updated it. I modernized it. And that is the absolute best, most custom justifiable purchase I've ever made in my whole entire life. I bought that van and I could do so much with it. If I just want to go biking for the day. I have my van throw it on the back or throw it inside. Yeah. Fridge loaded, clothes in there. I could take a shower. I don't have to just go somewhere, do an activity, turn around, come back, get back, I can stay that night if I yep. want to. Yep. And I, I, this summer I went out to uh, Hither Hills and Montauk, uh, spent some time in the Hamptons. I went up to the Finger Lakes, Ithaca, did all waterfall hikes. Uh, I did um, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia on a trip there right in the van, stay in a couple campgrounds. Sometimes you stay on the side of the road and, and that's the freedom of having a van versus some other type of RV that you pretty much tied into an RV park. Yeah, exactly. So you save some money that way there. The other thing with the van is that depending upon the size of the unit that you have, many times you can just park in a regular car parking spot at a, uh, at a shopping mall or a restaurant where you don't have to you know, if you miss a turn, you don't have to go three miles down the street to be. Able, I know when we had a big class A, that was always an issue. Um, but hey, circle the block a few times and say, where yeah. are we going to park this thing exactly. so we don't have fun? Exactly. Exactly. And it also, you know, if you're out on some back roads and you want to get a little adventure, it's hard to do that with a class A motorhome because most of the times you're towing a car behind you yep. and you can't back up. And that's a whole big deal right. to take that all apart right. to go right. turn around. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, you see a road, hey, let's check this one out. Where does it go? And that's part of the adventure. That's that's part of the fun. So having uh, something small enough the size of an SUV or pickup truck gives you a little bit more freedom in that respect. Yeah. I like downtowns. I like historic downtowns. I like breweries. 
So when I take my Airstream camper van out, I can parallel park right downtown, right with the rest of the vehicles. Yeah. And I can get in, I can be in there and catching up on emails. I'm not camping. I'm just parked there. Um, but if I wanted to stay overnight, as long as it, you're not putting an awning out or setting right. a fire on the you know, sidewalk yeah. and camping, you could you could do that in most yeah. areas. Yeah. Well, Patrick, we want to thank you so much for uh, spending time with us here on the Camper Report Show, and let our uh, we want to let our viewers know that uh, New Jersey Outdoor Adventures, right? That yes, is New the Jersey name Outdoor of the YouTube Adventures. channel. It's got so much content in it, so much information on everything having to do with the van life. And um, we want to, again, thank you so much for being with us here on the Camp Report Show. Well, thanks for having me back. It always seems like time flies. It seems time like we flies. Two minutes. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. And we are, we are, are over time right now. And yeah. um, you know what? People can find out more about you at... New England, excuse me, not New England, New Jersey Outdoor Adventures. And uh, our guest has been Patrick Botticelli. Thank you so much, Patrick. And we want to let you know that you are watching the Camper Report Show. 